All governments are immoral and criminal institutions because they force everyone under threat of violence to pay mandatory taxes for life. There are hundreds of taxes, from property tax to income tax to inheritance tax. You must pay them all, or else the government will use the power and force of its machinery to seize your bank account, garnish your wages, and or arrest you and put you in jail. How is that any different than the Mafia? Governments demand we pay our dues regularly, promise us we'll be safe and protected if we do, and if we don't, agents come around to shake us down or put us away. If taxes were voluntary, then governments wouldn't automatically be immoral or criminal because they would be completely funded by donation only, thus their very existence limited by voluntarism. If governments actually did a good job and spent our money wisely, then people might willingly donate for social programs, roads, schools, etc. But when taxes are compulsory, and a huge percentage of them goes towards lining the pockets of politicians, I can't help but think privatization of social programs, road construction, schools, and everything else the government unsatisfactorily provides us would be better for society by letting the free market and small communities and neighborhoods decide instead of our immoral criminal governments. Another mandatory tax and despicable limitation that all governments enforce is our natural right to international travel. In reality, the world is one undivided whole. All divisions, such as countries and borders, are merely man-made thought constructs with no reality outside our minds. They are just arbitrary lines drawn on a map that governments are constantly changing. But everyone has to be born somewhere, so governments quickly brand you with the curse of nationality the instant you are born. Now I am American because I was born within the arbitrary borders of the fictional construct known as America. Since I'm American, but I've made the decision to live outside the arbitrary borders of the fictional construct I was born in, Thailand, I have a whole new series of taxes and government mandates that apply. I am required to carry around an expensive microchipped passport identification and check in with the immigration office every three months to fill out some paperwork and give them more money. Every six months to a year, I am required to cross the arbitrary borders of the fictional construct known as Thailand into a neighboring tax farm's embassy, where I must fill out more paperwork and give them yet more money for temporary visa stamps in my passport. To work abroad, governments require us slaves to submit work permits and pay annually for the privilege. The taxes and headaches never end. Thanks to being American, I'm actually lucky that I can live abroad at all and should be happy. Many people from less fortunate tax farms are completely restricted from traveling to or working in other more fortunate tax farms. Another one is land rights. How can you honestly claim to be a landowner when you have to pay property taxes every year for as long as you own it? If you own it, why do you still have to pay annual rental fees? The government holds the allodial titles and just issues you a slave deed. They maintain eminent domain and can plow over your home to build a highway any time they please. Name one thing that governments provide that people couldn't do better, easier, and more efficiently, privately, at the community level. Name one reason why we have to run this never-ending hamster wheel of government mandate and taxation. There is nowhere on earth you can go that isn't controlled by a statist government. Every piece of land has been divided up and claimed by 196 nations, all of which are controlled by some form of forced governance. There is nowhere left on earth that sovereign, freedom-loving individuals can go live freely without a mafioso government forcing them to pay taxes and obey laws. No matter whether you live under a monarchy, an oligarchy, or a republic, whether it's called democracy, communism, socialism, or fascism, all current forms of government initiate and mandate violence and slavery upon their populations. We are all slaves to our governments because every nation forces under threat of violence and kidnapping that we must pay them a percentage of our income. In some countries, like Thailand, it's around 30%. America, 40 to 50%. France is around 60% not to mention hundreds of other smaller mandatory taxes which raise these figures even higher. So if the definition of slavery is forcefully taking 100% of someone's income, what is it called when governments forcefully take 60% of someone's income? Is that not slavery? What if they only take 30%? Is that still slavery? We are taught in school that slavery ended long ago, and it is universally understood that slavery is immoral. 
but if governments still are forcibly taking even 1% of their population's income, that is still slavery, and even 1% slavery is immoral. The very definition of the word government is mind control, and the vast majority of people worldwide, public and private sector alike, are absolutely mind-controlled by their governments, medias, and education systems to believe that their statist government is a moral and altruistic institution that exists for the benefit of the people. The reality is, of course, the opposite. The reality is that all nations are like open-air slave plantations, allowing their indentured servant populations to choose their occupation, giving the illusion of freedom, then swooping in on payday to steal the fruits of your labor. This is why all governments are criminal and immoral, and why the only system of just governance is anarchism, agorism, or voluntarism. There is no political solution to the problem of government. Voting for a new ceremonial figurehead every four years has never, will never, and could never create any significant lasting positive change because governments cannot be improved or made moral from within. There are too many vested interests, and no statist system, be it monarchy, oligarchy, communism, democracy, republic, or dictatorship, none of them respect the right of the individual to opt out of being governed. When the mafia comes around to your business, they always befriend and promise to protect you, providing you pay and obey them. If you refuse to comply, however, the mafia burns your business to the ground. Similarly, all statist governments promise to help and protect their populations, as long as we pay and obey. But if we don't, then they seize our asses and our assets and throw us in prison. The whole problem is giving one privileged class the legal right and obligation to commit violence and coercion against the rest of the population. All governments around the world initiate the use of violence, in the form of police, and coercion, in the form of taxes, against their populations, and this is absolutely immoral and unacceptable. Consensual sex is moral because it is voluntary, whereas rape is immoral because it's forced. Similarly, things like charity donations and the free market are moral because they are voluntary, whereas theft and taxation are immoral because they are forced. The root problem festering within all governments around the world is not the rife internal corruption or criminality. Those are merely symptoms and side effects of statism. The paramount problem with government is that its mandates are mandatory, its compulsions are compulsory. For governments to be moral institutions, all taxes and interactions must be made voluntary. If governments are honestly in existence for our benefit, then they must be voluntary and never initiate the use of force against their populations. That kind of authoritarian violence and coercion is not allowed or acceptable in any other facet of our lives. We wouldn't put up with it. So why do we sheepishly line up to vote for a new puppet president every four years, thinking they are somehow going to make the mafia moral? Simply working for the government, whether you're a soldier, policeman, politician, or otherwise, your salary comes from the taxes the population are forced to pay, making you a criminal by proxy. Thus working for statist governments, like working for the mafia, is immoral and criminal because your paycheck comes from stolen money. In other words, all governments, everyone working for them and benefiting from their social programs, are like getaway drivers in a robbery. They may not have personally stolen your money, but your money is right there in their pockets, so who is responsible if not them? I'm not a fan of isms, but the second you express a sound idea, the establishment is quick to rebrand your revolution and assimilate your inspiration into an ism they can control. For instance, anarchy, a once respectable term, simply meaning without rulers, advocating society without government, has long been rebranded hand in hand with chaos, wearing bandana face masks, throwing Molotov cocktails. The actual idea of non-violent sovereign societies, enlightened and capable beyond the need for statist governments, however, is certainly ideal, and not chaos. The terms agorism and voluntarism are similar ideas advocating only voluntary interactions between people and the state. Call it what you will, anarchism, agorism, voluntarism, or just keep it simple and call it freedom. It is the missing ingredient in all governments and the root of all state corruption and criminality. If people want to have a bureaucracy of diplomats creating a bunch of social programs for their benefit, what governments claim to be, then that's fine. But just because some guy in a suit wrote something on a piece of paper doesn't make it mandatory. And just because the mafia says you'd better pay up doesn't mean you should. A 
Our current so-called justice system is such an unenlightened corrupt farce that the entire edifice should be relegated to the history books. Humanity desperately needs to reconsider the idea that justice is somehow served by systematically fining, caging, or killing criminals. The idea that we should pay and empower unaffected parties to deliver standardized punishments, and the idea that police are anything but violent and coercive policy enforcers of our statist mafia governments. Today there are literally millions of laws and legislations on record in the United States alone, and under the current official edict, ignorance of these laws is no excuse for disobeying. Therefore, all citizens are legally bound, under threat of theft, kidnapping, and imprisonment, to read, remember, understand, and obey millions of ever-increasing laws or else. Millions of nitpicking restrictions our nagging nanny state has decided us children must completely refrain from under any circumstance or else receive severe punishment. Ridiculous things with no ill-affected party, such as the consumption of cannabis, a naturally growing plant that governments all over the world have deemed evil enough to cage you in prison for decades should you dare allow the weed's demon seed to take root in your soil. Such laws are nothing but anti-freedoms written by people so far above the law that they can write the laws. But surely we need some form of law and order, court system, and police protection, everyone cries out in knee-jerk unison. Here is all we need. Common law courts, which settle lawful disputes between two affected parties regarding matters of injury, theft, or breach of contract. That is all. No state agents, district attorneys, or police enforcing statutes and codes. No maritime admiralty or other kangaroo courts. The only disputes which require the kind of mediation provided by courts and judges are those between two affected parties in the case of harm to one's person or property, theft, or breach of contract, the holy trinity of common law. Everything which requires court mediation falls within these three simple categories, and anything beyond or outside these categories are victimless crimes involving no injured party and have no business being called law. By eliminating these millions of laws and leaving only three would so drastically reduce the amount of court cases per district per year that they could be run very cheaply in a voluntarist society. Eliminating these millions of laws would also reduce the amount of people in prison by over 90%. America currently houses 25% of the world's prisoners, yet Americans themselves account for only 5% of the world population. Over 2 million in a population of 300 million, meaning almost 1% of the entire U.S. population is currently living in cages, and over 90% of these for victimless crimes. The insane way these people are being treated is disgusting, and society has turned a collective blind eye to their plight. Meanwhile, the injustice system also goes to great lengths protecting truly evil people from receiving what they deserve. Recently in Thailand, a man shot and killed his wife point-blank for ignoring him and chatting on Line Messenger too often. He then proceeded to kill his mother-in-law, and when his son came to investigate, he shot him too. He then fired another round in all of them to make sure they were dead. When his daughter came home, he contemplated killing her, but after much begging and pleading decided to spare her life and instead just stole her gold necklace to help finance his escape. When police finally caught him, they forced him to do a reenactment of the entire murder at the scene of the crime, as they always do here in Thailand, and 200 angry neighbors stormed in to try to hang him to death. It took 50 police officers to stop the 200 villagers from doing what all of them deemed just and necessary, which is banding together to end the life of this heartless psychopath who killed three members of their village. Had these 50 police state agents not been there to protect this murderer of innocent women and children from his enraged community, this spontaneously formed jury of 200 of his peers surely would have hung him or beat him to death. In a natural tribal society, that is certainly what would have happened. His community would have collectively decided his fate based on each member's willingness to forgive or to engage in some act or form of retribution. Now, instead, he will be taken through the modern criminal justice system, which means rather than being hung or stomped to death by his legitimately livid peers, he is protected and caged by government mafia thugs, while all affected parties are dragged through years of appeals, draining everyone's savings, waiting for the final judgment of some Freemason in a white powder wig and black dress, banging a wooden hammer, yammering on about order and honor. 
the entire thing is a corrupt farce, as for example, in the case of eight and nine-year-old satanic ritual abuse victims Gabrielle and Alyssa Dearman, they are being raped and kidnapped by the very state police and social service workers who are supposed to be protecting them and pursuing justice. How can justice ever be served when the courts, lawyers, judges, and police are more corrupt than the average street criminals on trial? As I wrote in my book Asbestos Ed, Laws leave crime victims powerless to right their own wrongs the way they see fit, and instead pay and empower unaffected people to enforce standardized punishments. If someone lies to, steals from, cheats, kidnaps, rapes, or murders someone I know, then me, my friends, and my family deserve to deliver the punishment. Not only that, but in these intense situations, me, my friends, and my family do not want to sit still and wait for cops to do the best they can with what the law provides. We're going to do the best we can with what God provides and use our God-given freedom to enforce our own ethics, whether it's retribution or forgiveness. Justice should be whatever just us decide. Suppose I watch you kill my daughter. The law says for me to leave you be, call the police, collect evidence, consult a lawyer, then testify to a box of peers who'll hopefully lock you away through years of appeals until finally you get the death penalty or die of old age. If instead I do the natural thing in such a situation and kill you myself, then it's your daughter's turn to collect evidence, consult the lawyer, testify to a box of peers who'll keep me in and out of appeals, each one feeding the system, paying police and judicial employee paychecks, greasing those greedy wheels of status justice with years of our grief just for doing the just thing. Furthermore, suppose I watch you kill my daughter, and instead of wishing you dead, instead of pursuing retribution of some sort, Suppose I wish to take the highest moral ground and end the cycle of suffering, to stop the continuation of evil with my unconditional forgiveness. Suppose I wish to pardon you from all punishment, I wish you no harm, and that your family need not grieve the way ours does. If after all this I actually wish for your forgiveness, we'll find it's against the law. I have to destroy evidence, consult a lawyer, then testify to a box of peers that it's all insanity, forgive those umpteen sardines, and send them home. We love everybody and we're so sorry. Please love us and leave us alone. Stop locking us up in courtrooms and let us determine our own misdemeanors, or at least give us forgiveness as an option. It is important to note, governments, just like countries, borders, laws, and other abstract concepts, do not actually exist. It sure seems like governments exist since they have the power to murder, steal from, or imprison their populations for whatever whims tickle their fancy, but in actual fact, they do not exist. Only people exist. People in fitted uniforms exist. Police, soldiers, politicians, prison guards, public school teachers, and welfare recipients exist. The people who work for and benefit from the system are the system. Without people willing to murder, steal from, or imprison their fellow brothers and sisters in the name of government, there is no government. What government would we have if no one showed up on election day? Who would shake us down if no one paid up on tax day? Who would brainwash our children if no one sent them to public schools? Who would fight foreign wars if no one would be a soldier? If people stopped working for the government, the government would cease to exist. If people stopped voting, if people stopped paying taxes, the government would cease to exist. Police, soldiers, politicians, all other government workers and welfare recipients are the beneficiaries of our stolen money. They are all upstanding, parasite citizens employed by a parasite system to parasite off everyone else. They are all anti-entrepreneurs, actively working against the free market. They are people who, through their actions, agree with, enable, and enforce violence and coercion against their fellow man. They grant themselves the legal right to counterfeit their own currency and imprison anyone else who tries. Their paychecks come from the taxes we are all forced to pay them. Their means of subsistence is counterfeit and theft. And these thieves have the power to put us in prison if we don't willingly hand over our hard-earned money, whenever and however much they ask for. Governmental literally translates to mind control. It's time people realize they've been brainwashed by their mafia governments. Stand up and say to all government employees, a big no thanks for your service. To all the soldiers and policemen, to all politicians and government employees around the world, consider this a big no thanks for your service. Your paychecks all come from money stolen by force from your hard-working fellow countrymen and women. 
Your employer, your national government, is 100% funded by tax money, taxes which your populations are forced to pay under threat of kidnapping, imprisonment, and often murder. To be employed by an immoral and criminal organization like a statist government is immoral and criminal. To receive stolen money and call it your salary is immoral and criminal. I implore all government workers to leave your jobs and pursue an occupation with real integrity. Find a way to earn money without stealing from everyone. Get a job where customers pay you voluntarily. I know it's not as easy as just forcing people to pay your salaries, but it is the moral thing to do. And to everyone else, let your soldiers, police, and politicians know, no thanks for your service, and no we don't support the troops. We don't support any occupation built on stolen money, much less an occupation built on the blood of millions of innocents. We send young men and women off to kill and be killed, maim and be maimed, all for the propagation of corporate imperialism and statist hegemony. Then, if and when they ever come home, demoralized and depressed, ridden with regret and post-traumatic stress, we herald them as heroes. But the truth is, every time a soldier leaves his home country, he becomes a terrorist. If you're interested in defending your country and protecting your family for free, join a local militia. If you're interested in leaving your country to attack other people's families for money, join the national military. The former is respectable. The latter is irreputable.